Well, let's begin with the latest. This is kind of interesting. We don't do these every day, but the latest morning consult survey shows President Biden holding a two-point advantage over Donald Trump, 44 to 42 among registered voters nationwide. That's within the polls margin in the era. What's interesting, though, is it's a pretty big shift from a January survey, which found Trump leading Biden 45 percent to 40 percent. The swing toward Biden is partly due to an increase in support among independents. In January, independents backed Trump by 10 points, 38 percent to 28 percent in the latest poll. Biden and Trump are tied with 34 percent each. What do you think, Joe? Well, you know, Will, we always say it's about trend lines. This is one of many polls, but we're saying that more often lately. Oh, this is just one of many polls, one of many polls. What, what we saw last week was a poll that showed Biden making great strides and doing it on the strength of younger voters coming home. What we're seeing now is Biden making really good strides on the strength of independents coming home. And I saw Dan Pfeiffer, I think it was Dan Pfeiffer, saying the important thing about the State of the Union address wasn't that it was going to give Biden a quick bump. It's that it proved the Republican lie that he was some doddering old man, some doddering idiot. Just proved that to be a complete lie, that this is a guy that actually gave better than he got. Mm. And it's actually House Republicans and Donald Trump that are looking like, you know, like And it's interesting idiots. because idiots. that's what the Biden campaign wants the public to believe and wants us to believe, which is the more they see of Joe Biden, and in contrast, the more they see of Donald Trump, the more independents in particular are going to like Joe Biden. So they saw the State of the Union. You've seen a bump since then for the press. And they said, OK, he looks solid that night. He's up to this job. And now they're seeing more and more of Donald Trump. They're seeing the repulsive stuff he's putting on social media. Mm. They're watching how he behaves outside the courtroom. And people who may have tried to tune politics out and who could blame them for the last couple of years are starting to tune back in and go, ugh, I don't think yeah. I want to do this show again. I don't want to see this movie again. So yeah. we'll see if those trend lines continue. But certainly in the last couple of weeks, in the favor of President Biden. Well, and Gene, two things going on also right now is you have you have – Trump getting more important by the day. Uh, you know, all these people, say, oh, they're just tweets. Oh, they're not, not just yeah. tweets. Yeah. No, this yeah. is an out and out call for authoritarianism. This isn't just tweets. This is calling for the assassination mm -hmm. of political pundits. So you have that yeah. on one side. And I, you know, especially these Wall Street guys, you know, oh, I will never vote for Donald Trump ever. And then, you know, three days later, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward it, which is just. It's obscene. It's absolutely obscene. And this BS, oh, Joe Biden's a socialist. They love to say that. Joe Biden's a, so a really, mm -hmm. yeah, is yeah. that why you get richer by the second? Is that why you have more <laughs> money than you know? You know, their problem tax season is, it, it really is. If, if yeah. they're investing in the stock market, it's not that he's a socialist and they've got to figure out how to hide money. It's that they're making too much money. Mm -hmm. And they got to figure out how to hide yeah. all the record profits they've made this yeah. year. Stock mm -hmm. market at an all-time high. So that's on one side, right? This, mm -hmm. this desperation to justify supporting a fascist because you think it may be good for your bottom line. Yeah. And then on the other side, you have the fact that Joe Biden is doing something, Gene, that nobody has done to Donald Trump in all of his years mm -hmm. in politics. Mm -hmm. He's taken it to him every day he's mocking yeah. and ridiculing him donald trump can't even put up anymore that he cheated to win his club championship anymore without biden making a fool of him everywhere he moves yeah. biden and his campaign are just tweaking him mocking him and suddenly this bully isn't looking so tough absolutely don't underestimate the mocking this is really you know a lot of people sort of question that at at first is this really the right uh, line for the for the biden campaign to take i think we can now say yes it is it's a very promising line for the biden campaign to take and it drives donald trump crazy uh and th that's a that's not much of a drive actually i mean he's he's, al <laughs> he's already there but but um he's going to get increasingly frantic increasingly cornered by all these court cases by all the money he has to put up um and it, th this is a this is a bad period in this campaign 
campaign for Donald Trump. Uh, and I think there's, there, there's every reason to expect that it's, it's going to get worse. As you said, watch the trend lines. The trend lines are clearly in Biden's favor right now. Um, uh, I know we're going to talk about Florida later, but what happened in Florida yesterday, uh, per, you know, potentially puts that red state back in play, a state without which uh, Republicans cannot win. Uh, Donald Trump cannot conceivably win. Um, at the very least, he's going to have to put a whole lot of, of, of time and money in trying to defend Florida. It's, it's, uh, it, it's not the sort of rosy uh, political picture that they like to paint down at Mar-a-Lago anymore. In fact, uh, it's not looking, not looking so good uh, for the former president. So I was speaking yesterday to a senior Biden campaign official who said, first of all, in the State of the Union, that target message was nervous Democrats. That's the audience they needed to reach. In the likes of David Axelrod, who a few months ago said mm -hmm. Joe Biden should step aside, is now saying he's our guy. And not just to pick on Axelrod, there's a lot of Democrats who are feeling that, Molly. They've now feeling much better about their candidate's chances that he's up to the job. And we're seeing that movement here after a pretty a, a campaign blitz through eight battleground states. The other thing this official said to me yesterday is their theory of the case has long been. We've talked about it on the show. The more Americans hear Donald Trump, the more they'll be repulsed by him. And independents and swing voters will say, ah, we can't do that again. Well, the issue is Trump's largely been off stage the last yeah. month, and these numbers have already started to move. That changes tonight. Donald Trump is going to be in Wisconsin delivering his first rally in front of a crowd of people in a month. If that Easter, Easter True Social post was any preview, we're going to be in for some unhinged comments. And then we know how he reacts to pressure. Political pressure, starting to trail in the polls legal pressure. He's got to be in a court in two weeks. This could go south pretty quick for him. Yeah. I mean, look, the visual of him sitting in a New York City courtroom for weeks and weeks with people like his former fixer, Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, and maybe Hope Hicks, right? We don't know who's testifying where. I, I think that's going to be really a rough visual for voters. And, and look, we've never had an election where one candidate is sitting in a courtroom like this for weeks and weeks. So I actually think it's I think it's really going to be a heavy lift. And just because all of this has helped him with the base, he needs to expand the electorate in order to win, right? He's never worked on expanding the electorate. And I think that this is going to be, I think this is a bad look for swing voters. And has no interest in expanding the electorate. Mm. He won't even go after Nikki Haley's voters, who are Republicans, who he needs to bring back into the fold. He says, no, you know, and, and Joe Biden's taking the campaign, taking advantage of that with aides courting Nikki Haley's voters. But what's interesting, to Molly's point inside that poll, the, the top line number is interesting, but the independent swing of 10 points yeah. in just a couple of months, that's where the action is in the general election. Right. What, I mean, we need to brace ourselves for an unhinged Trump, I think. Jonathan is right. But he's in Michigan and he's in Wisconsin yep. for a reason. Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So I understand the consult poll is a snapshot, but I want to understand what the swing has been in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, because we know that's what matters, right? And so... It's great to see Joe Biden out there, the, the, as Joe, you described, what's happening coming out of the State of the Union. But what matters? Michigan, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. I miss those, those three states. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're right. If he wins those, that's it. That's it. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Jonathan, uh, how are they feeling in those states right now? Uh, certainly better. There's still worries about Michigan. Michigan. We know that the Gaza conflict really weighs heavily there. Some Biden aides have said to me that they, they think that some of those Muslim voters, Arab American voters, young voters, they're gone. They're not going to they're not going to come back to him. They, they're not going to go to Donald Trump, but they're going to stay home or find a third party candidate. But they feel like they can f stitch together a, a coalition there to still win. Wisconsin is actually it, usually the, the closest of these three states. Yeah. That's the one they feel best about right Isn't now. It's, the, 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 it's been trending that way. Uh, the, there was obviously an abort, there have been some abortion decisions there of late that they feel like is breaking their their favor. Uh, they and, like the Senate race there too. Strangely enough, older white dudes, yeah, yeah. Mm, have held for Biden. Yeah, it's we. I say it's really strange because we have this. We have all these sort of uh, simplifications of how. Voters go, but there there are older white men are doing much better for Biden, and I suspect it's because 
you know, I guess the older you are, the more conservative you are, which usually turns you against Democrats and toward Republicans. But here, conservative with a small C looks at a guy that's trying to destroy the, their life that they've known for 60, 65 years. They want no part of it. And also the president has done things for seniors, yeah. for capping prescription drug costs and, right. and the like. Uh, and, then, and then Pennsylvania, of course, is the state where President Biden has spent the most time in. It's, it's in his backyard. They know Trump's strength in rural areas. That's going to decide. This, well, one could argue the whole election is going to come down to whether they can turn out voters in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Young yes. voters, black yeah. voters. That might be the whole thing. But yeah. having, right now they feel okay. But having Democratic governors Helps. in those three states really does help. And good Senate candidates in all yeah. three. Yeah. Hey, Mika. Hey, TJ, can you put up that, um, that Fox News poll? Showed only 32% of Americans oppose uh, or want abortion to be illegal most of the time. You see that number, 32%? You can go back and look at Gallup polls. You can look at other polls over the past 10, 20, 30 years. That number's always at about a third, mm -hmm. right? So think about this. Americans' position on abortion hasn't changed. Their legislators have become that much more extreme. Mm -hmm. And because of it, Republicans are losing races everywhere. Kentucky, Kansas. I think about Wisconsin, where they had a, 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 a judgeship, a Supreme Court judgeship, that would determine the future of so many things in Wisconsin. But because Republicans were stuck defending an 1848 mm -hmm. abortion ban, they got wiped out. Now, again, I'm not saying that Republicans are going to get beaten in the state of Florida. Um, I will say this, though, Jonathan Lemire, you look at those numbers, and then you look at, at the type of Republican that has put Florida out of reach for Democrats. It's not like right-wing um, Christian nationalists saying, let's move down to Florida. It's, you know, people that are moving down because they don't want to pay state income taxes. Mm -hmm. People that are moving down for business reasons. People moving down economic. I mean, all in all, that's been, that's been the story. That's been the issue. And so when you have such an extreme position being taken, and it is extreme if you look at, if you look at the polls, if you look at the numbers, this isn't going to help Republicans even with the influx of 500, 600,000 Republicans that have streamed into that state over the past several years. Yeah, some to escape COVID regulations everywhere else, too. I mean, there's no doubt since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, abortion rights access has been a winner. It's been a winner for Democrats in every state. And that's why, Eddie, the Biden campaign thought North Carolina was the place to get a pickup this time around because there's going to be abortion access on the ballot there as well. They feel like that's the place where they could flip from red to blue. The campaign manager, Julie chavez Rodriguez put out a memo last night to NBC uh, suggesting they now think Florida is winnable too. I think we can all register some skepticism to that. Right. Uh, but at the very least, it might make the Republicans spend resources, resources they don't have, uh, defending Florida, a very expensive state uh, in which to advertise. So weigh in on that, but more than that, how we started this. This is now something Donald Trump has to wear, and he's trying to dance about abortion rights. On one hand, he tries to distance himself from this fight. On the other hand, he brags about appointing three Supreme Court justices who overturn Roe. And now he's got to wear something to, a more extreme policy that DeSantis put into place. That's not going to be easy even beyond the borders of Florida. Oh, absolutely. And we know that women across a range of demographics are, are animated around this issue and they're going to turn out and they're going to impact the election. I don't know if that will mean that Florida will actually be winnable, but it will, as you say, force the Republicans to spend resources in the state, which they don't have. But I want to say this too that's really important. In the interim between this six-week ban and the constitutional ban, we have to think about what will happen to women in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And so we understand the politics, and I think it's important for us to think about what this means in the long run and how it plays out in the presidential election, but we need to be mindful of what's going to be happening to little girls, young women, yeah. and women, and their reproductive health care in the state of Florida because of this nonsense. Mm.
All right. Uh, we're going to move to Ukraine and uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson reportedly coming around to the idea of Ukraine aid, so long as he can get a political win out of it. The New York Times reports Johnson is allegedly hinging his support on a measure that would force President Biden to reverse a pause on new permits for liquefied natural gas export facilities. Should that happen, it would give the speaker a personal win, unblocking a proposed export facility in his home state of Louisiana. Johnson has also discussed financing some of the aid by selling off Russian sovereign assets that have been frozen and turning the money into loans the Ukrainians would have to pay back. The speaker has not publicly pledged his support for any option, but he has stated the House will address Ukraine uh, once it returns to Washington next week. Let's bring NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. Ali, what more do we know about this? There's a little Trumpy sound to that, making Ukraine pay back. Yeah, that's definitely one of the ideas, though, that's percolating, Mika, in large part because we've seen the idea of just giving continued direct aid to Ukraine fall flat, especially among key people within Johnson's House Republican conference. Now, if it wasn't Ukraine, it would be the appropriations package that has him in trouble. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't the appropriations package, it would be the border. You can really pick any issue. And the realities of a very slim margin that seems to always be getting slimmer in the House GOP becomes evident when you speak about the way that Mike Johnson is going to navigate this next stretch going forward. Now, the House has been on recess for the last week. They don't come back until next week. This is him trying to get his ducks in a row here. Mm. But it's now the second time that we've heard this idea of frozen Russian assets being a way to possibly give aid to Ukraine, even if it's just on a loan basis. This is not just something mm -hmm. that House Republicans are talking about amongst themselves either. When President Zelensky last week spoke with Johnson, he referenced this idea in in his tweet sort of giving a readout of what they talked about. So this is something that could be gaining traction. But I think it's also important to note the way that he's pairing it with the potential to do more on liquefied natural gas. Of course, that's something that helps him at home, as you mentioned, as well as abroad. But then also the idea that they're also going to try to contend with the border, which has been such a thorny issue the entire time that he's been speaker, which, again, has not been the entirety of this Congress. We all remember what happened right. at the end of last year that landed Mike Johnson in this very tough position to begin with. Yeah, Gene Robinson, though, uh, it looks as if uh, the speaker understands he really needs to get the yes. I'm sure he's hearing from... He has the chairman, chairwomen that, that run the most important foreign policy committee saying, you know, you either get there or we'll, we'll find a way to get there, if it's, whether it's a petition or but but it looks like we're moving in that direction. Yeah, it looks like things are moving in, in that direction, but boy, are they moving slowly. You know, the House doesn't even get back until next week. And so uh, meanwhile, uh, the, the days pass, the clock. Ticks. And Dave, a question for David Ignatius. David, you were just in Ukraine. Uh, you interviewed President Zelensky. What is the situation on the ground there now? How long can Ukraine hold out and how are the Ukrainians doing? So, Gene, he was very specific about what the delay of nearly six months in approving this package is meant for Ukraine. They can't get started in building new brigades that they need for offense uh, coming later this year or next year. Uh, he said that unless the aid comes, he's going to have to shrink his lines, meaning retreat, uh, if he's only got uh, 2,000 of the 8,000 artillery shells he needs, he said, the only way to handle that is to have a smaller front line that he has to defend. So he's talking about, about having to move west uh, as the Russians advance. A lot of really frightening possibilities. I think Ukraine will be enormously relieved if this package does go through. Uh, I'm, I'm told that Ukrainian soldiers in their trenches look at their phones to see what the latest news is from the U.S. Congress, if you can imagine that. So, so this will be a morale booster for the people who are fighting so hard in that country. Just a final thing. Uh, while the Ukrainians have been waiting for the United States to provide this aid, 
they haven't just sat around. They've been developing their own weapons. And they're now sending those weapons into Russia. There was a strike uh, just over the last 24 hours, 1,300 kilometers from Ukraine to a Russian target. So they've got drones of their own, not our drones, that can hit targets that far away. Those refineries that you've seen ablaze, those have been hit by Ukrainian drones. So they're not waiting. They need those weapons. Uh, but but they're, they're determined not, not to give up. All right. The Washington Post, David Ignatius, thank you so much for your insights this morning. We Let's bring right now theologian and New York Times bestselling author Jim Wallace. His latest book is out today entitled The False, False White Gospel, Rejecting Christian Nationalism, Reclaiming True Faith and Denouncing and Refounding Democracy. The Washington Post, Eugene Robinson and Princeton's Eddie Gloud Jr. are back with us as well. As well. Jim, thank you for being with us. Um, now I'll just ask you outright what, I, what I've been wondering for years. If you have what we Christians consider to, to have, the greatest story ever told, the most remarkable, and especially as we, as we move past Easter, a story, a life, a savior who needs no embellishments. If we have that, and that savior has, has, has changed so many people's lives and completely rewritten the history of Western civilization time and again over the past 2,000 years, why do they have to make things up? Why do they have to embrace QAnon? Why do they have to embrace a failed reality TV host and take him on as the other Jesus, their new savior? First of all, Joe, thank you for covering the faith factor in this election. What I call the faith factor, I think it could be decisive. So the old story, it's often been distorted and manipulated and used for purposes of power. It's being used again. We face in this crisis a test of democracy, indeed, but also a test of faith. And the integrity of our faith communities is really at stake here. And uh, politics is fine, but we got to go deeper than politics. Because every nation has its better angels and worse demons. And Donald Trump in what I call the false white gospel, is, is marketing our worst demons. Marketing our worst demons. So how do we engage our better angels? I like you mentioned Easter. As you and I know, Easter is not just a day, it's a season. <laughs> so we're, we're entering into this Easter season as I begin this, this nationwide town meeting tour about faith and democracy. This is an Easter book, yeah. an Easter book. It's about resistance and hope at the same time. Eddie, um, I'll ask you the same question, and then please feel free to ask Jim a question. But, but why, why do we find ourselves where we are with, with people of faith who, again, have all they need? Than the four corners of the Bible. Why? Why now do they do they seek false idols, seek false and just say it out loud that 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 he is a Christ-like figure. He is the other Christ. He is the their savior. Why? You know, Joe. There's a complicated history of Christianity in this country. You know that we we talk about the tradition of American liberalism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the historian Stephen Hahn talks about the tradition of American illiberalism. And there's a religious scaffolding to that. You know, Frederick Douglass, says, as you mentioned in the book, Jim, talks about the slave auction block being right next to the church steeple. That compromise that infected, you know, American Christendom, that before one shell was shot at Fort Sumter, the church had already split over the issue of slavery. And so there's always been this idol of race at the heart of American Christendom in the United States and the temptation of idols that could lead to the distortion of one's faith and one's belief. And that's why I would really love to ask you, Jim, 
what what is the substance of of the false white gospel? Why isn't it just simply a false gospel? And two, how are we to respond to this? In the book, you give us, you know, these wonderful passages from the Bible, right? You take us to the word as a way to respond to what we're seeing. So give us a sense of what what can we do in the face of all of, of this, what you've described. As we both know, our demons, our racial demons run very deep, run very deep. And so this is a time to bring the story back, mm. bring that story back. So I've taken six iconic biblical texts. You'll know the truth, says Jesus, and the truth will set you free. And the opposite of truth isn't just lying, it's captivity. Mm. Truth and freedom are indivisible. And we got a lot of folks who are captive, who are stuck. And the false white gospel is, is a co being co-opted by nationalism. A gospel co-opted by nationalism. And the Good Samaritan story, which I love, uh, I tell in the book, uh, here's Jesus lifting up the Samaritan, who was othered by people of his day, who helps an other to him, a Jew by the side of the road. And the Samaritan was mixed race and was attacked all the time. Here's the one Jesus lifts up as the example of how to be a neighbor. So your neighbor probably doesn't live in your neighborhood. <laughs> so I'm taking these texts to refresh them and reframe them. And I want to let Jesus do the talking, right? So I want to take it to these surrogates of Trump. And I want to say, okay, here's what the text is. Here's what Jesus says. Do we believe it or not? We either say we believe it and then apply it or not. So I want to, in this Easter season, also a critical political season, I want to have a conversation, mm -hmm. an interrogation of faith. I'm, uh, I, I'm so glad you brought up the Good Samaritan because Willie, uh, in our Easter service on, on, on Sunday, uh, the pastor talked about the, the, the question, what must I do to, to, to make it to the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, you must, of course, love God and you must love your neighbor as yourself. And he was asked directly, who is my neighbor? And what did Jesus do? He picked the despised Samaritan. Mm -hmm. He picked the foreigner. He picked the person that nobody he was talking to would want to stop by. That's who your neighbor is. Just like when people ask Jesus, why do you hang out with the dregs of society? What did Jesus say? He said, I didn't come here to, to like heal the healthy. I came here to heal the sick. So all of this other talk, all of this other, like the others is the antithesis of everything Jesus talked about through the entire Bible. It's that, crazy. That is the perfect setup for what I was going to ask you, Jim, which is, we look at the life of Jesus Christ and contrast it to the life, the character, the behavior, the morality of Donald Trump, and you couldn't find in our public life right now any more polar opposites. And yet, there are many people in this country that you write about in this book who are equating the two, Jesus Christ and Donald Trump. So in your conversations and your studies, what are the mental and moral gymnastics people have to perform to get to the conclusion that in some ways Donald Trump does represent Jesus Christ, that he is here to carry on somehow that legacy. The question, who is my neighbor, may be the most important question for democracy and its future. And it was asked by a lawyer, by the way, I think he was a Washington lawyer. I recognize that tone of voice. Yeah. Said, who is my neighbor? Exactly who is my neighbor? How can I get out of ob obligation here? So I think every movement has to figure out who they can persuade, and who they must defeat at the, ballot mm. box, at the ballot box. So I think there are persuadable people out there. I'm going to go and meet them all over the country. We're trying a book tour into a town meeting tour on faith and democracy. And I'm going to talk to lots of people, and I want to bring them back to the story. What did Jesus say? What did he mean? And you can't keep saying you're a believer. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I tell you? <laughs> so that's the question. And I want to have a, a debate on faith, because I think faith could be a factor now in these weeks and months ahead. And the fact that it's Easter makes it even more 
significant. So I, I know the history of those people. The I come from that background, right? But I had to find Jesus outside of my white church, white neighborhood, white school. The whiteness hmm. is an idol. And in the phrase white evangelical, the defining word there is not evangelical. It's white. And that has to change. And I think we can change it. And I think we can, we can transform people, but also we can help people find the language. I want this book to be a tool for people. Find the text, find the language, find the ways to speak about this. Because we're all influencers. People talk to their family and their friends. Uh, everybody can do something. This book is my two cents. <laughs> uh, but I want others to offer their two cents. And I, I believe in a God who increases the value of our two cents. The Texas Senate race will be one of the more closely watched matchups in November. A new poll shows incumbent Republican Senator Ted Cruz tied now with Democratic challenger Congressman Colin Allred. And Congressman Allred joins us now live in studio. Great to see you, Congressman. I think a lot of people saw that poll and they went, whoa, <laughs> he's out there doing his thing. I mean, yeah. Ted Cruz has been elected and reelected. He's been around a long time in Texas politics. I think some voters are just take it for granted. He's going to be the senator. Why are we seeing this kind of movement in your favor? I think fundamentally freedom is under attack in Texas right now. And it's not who we are, whether it's your freedom to make your own health care decisions, including access to an abortion or attacking, you know, banning books or telling kids what kind of hairstyle they can have in, in school. I mean, to me, uh, I see folks like Ted Cruz and the extremism they represent. That's not the Texas that I know. I'm a fourth generation Texan. I was born and raised in Dallas by a single mom. I played football at Baylor, played in the NFL, represented us in Congress for the last six years. I know who we are, and this isn't it. And I think that's what we're seeing reflected in the polls now, is that folks want to have a way to express that and to get rid of a senator who honestly only cares about himself. We've been talking this morning about the new uh, abortion law in Florida. Yeah. And the Supreme Court upholding 15 weeks will, will become six weeks as signed by Governor DeSantis last year. Are you seeing the impact of strict abortion laws in Texas in your race as well? Yeah. Well, you know, I feel for the, the folks in Florida because they're going to experience what we've experienced, which is what a near total ban on abortion looks like, which is 26,000 women who've given birth to their rapist child in Texas. That's according to the Houston Chronicle. Uh, it's a mother of two, like Kate Cox, who has a much wanted third pregnancy, who has to go to the emergency room four times. Her doctor says she needs a medically necessary abortion, and our state says no. In fact, they don't just say no. They say, we're going to prosecute you, your doctor, your hospital. Mm -hmm. We're at the beginning of seeing the impacts of this, I think, across Texas in our university systems, in our medical schools, in our business economy, where it's going to be harder to recruit and retain top talent. Uh, and to me, this extremism can't last, and that's why we have to rectify it at the federal level. And Molly, that's something we were talking about yeah. at the top of the show with Florida, which is there may be some people who who there are some people who like the six week ban, but there are many independents, Republicans, persuadable perhaps in the middle who go, hold on a second. That's gone way too far for well, us. Well, and we've seen in these states where they banned abortion that women who are pregnant get much less good medical care. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit? Are you seeing that on the yeah. ground? So my State of the Union guest was Dr. Austin Denard. She's an OBGYN in Dallas. Uh, she and her third pregnancy had to flee the state to get an abortion because her uh, baby's skull didn't form correctly. Uh, her husband is also an OBGYN, and they were telling me about uh, how difficult it is now to have these conversations in these rooms where, you know, my wife and I have had two boys in Dallas in the last five years. Every one of these ultrasounds or genetic tests, you're holding your breath, and you're hoping that they don't come in and say that there's a problem with the baby. And if, they, if there is, then that conversation becomes much harder. But also when I talk to our medical schools, They'll tell you that they're worried about uh, who's going to be applying to come to Texas, who's mm -hmm. willing to come to Texas, who wants to be an OBGYN in Texas. I mean, this is fundamental uh, that when you attack a right like this, that when you make these very difficult conversations even more difficult, that it has all these downstream impacts that we're just beginning to experience. You know, that, that, that issue that we're talking about right now is going to be enormous in the fall, state to state to state. But I would imagine, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, there's no state that's more impacted by the issue of immigration mm -hmm. and the border, yeah. Texas. That's right. What are the differences between you and your opponent, yeah. Ted Cruz, on the border? Yeah. Well, first of all, my family's from the border. Uh, my grandfather was a customs officer in Brownsville after serving the Navy in the Pacific. Uh, that's where my mom my aunt grew up. I spent a lot of my childhood in Brownsville visiting my grandma there. I know that our border communities are not just a political backdrop 
And I'm, I'm really sick and tired of folks going down there and treating it like they're on some kind of safari. You know, they put on their outdoor clothing and they go and they point out migrants in, in the weeds. What we need them to do is pass legislation to help us try and address this. And I heard y'all talking about it on the last segment. But the legislation that we were trying to you know, consider uh, in the Congress, no state would have benefited from that more than Texas because of the CBP agents that would have hired, because of the immigration judges that would have hired, because of the changes to the asylum system. We had 300,000 crossings in December alone. It's 10,000 a day. That's a crisis. And I'm a Democrat who say this, we have a crisis at the border. We have to respond to it in a way that I think is consistent with our values, though. And that, I think, is one of the biggest differences between me and Cruz. Also, the fact that he wants to use it as a political issue right. instead of trying to solve it. And to me, I think that's just untenable in Texas. So I'm curious, Congressman, is, I don't have to tell you, winning as a Democrat in Texas is no easy feat, especially when we're talking statewide in a Senate race. So when you go back to Waco, where you played college football, yeah. and you talk to maybe a Republican voter who doesn't love Ted Cruz, but just votes for him because he's there on the ballot, but maybe it's persuadable. Mm -hmm. What's your argument to those voters why you are not yeah. maybe the last guy who ran against Ted yeah. Cruz or that yeah. you're a different kind of Democrat? Yeah. yeah, I am a different kind of cat. And, you know, listen, I'm literally the most bipartisan member of the Texas delegation. So I, and I'm proud of it. I've gotten awards for it from the Chamber of Commerce. I've been named the most bipartisan. And so I work hard at that to try and bring us together. But also fundamentally, the issue we have in Texas with Ted Cruz is that he only cares about himself. That's how you can go to uh, Cancun when 30 million Texans are freezing in the dark. Uh, that's how uh, you know, I think you can podcast three times a week instead of being a serious legislator trying to actually get some things done, right? You know, I've been the exact opposite. You know, I, was, I, I was raised by a community. When you're raised by a single mom, you have to rely on your public schools, on your YMCA. You know, I played football because it was a way out for me. Uh, and it taught me you know, how to lead, but also how to bring folks together. And that's gonna be the fundamental difference between us. We have one of the chief dividers in the country and Ted Cruz. I'll be one of somebody who unites us. Um, you have a pretty wild state house <laughs> situation where Ken Paxton was impeached, there was a trial. Can you talk about, do, do you think that helps Democrats at all? Well, we're experiencing kind of a civil war, yeah. I, I guess you could say, uh, in the Texas Republican Party where uh, you know, the Speaker of the House, uh, who is incredibly conservative uh, and who passed a lot of conservative priorities, also thought, though, that you know you shouldn't be allowed to use the public dime to pay off, uh, you know, for your affair, which right. is what the impeachment of the attorney general was all about. Uh, and uh, for, for whatever reason, you know, politically in the Senate, that didn't happen. But now they're going after all of these very conservative Republicans who uh, said, you know what, listen, that, this is a bridge too far for me. But I also think it's a bridge too far for Texas voters. Uh, we have had it with this extremism. We've had it with being embarrassed by our elected officials. Uh, and in some ways, we have to have a, a self-correction. And that's what I think this election will be about. will be self-correcting for Texans, you know, sending a message that this kind of extremism doesn't work. And that'll be a win for Texans. But I think we'll also make a better Republican Party in Texas by doing that. Mika? Congress, I'm looking at, Congressman, uh, what Ted Cruz said, the press release he put out when uh, the Dobbs decision came out. He called it nothing short of a massive victory for life. Mm -hmm. Is that where Texas is, and how do you appeal to people who are used to having him representing them as the state of Texas? Well, Mika, in a lot of ways, as I said, we are now experiencing what a near-total ban on abortion looked like, uh, and we are experiencing it in a way that's deeply personal for so many Texas families. And the stories that are coming out mm -hmm. are so heartbreaking. And so in some ways, I think you could say that I'm sure many Texans didn't realize that this is what it would look like, that victims of rape and incest would have nowhere to go, uh, that families who you know, really want to welcome a child but who have, you know, get the bad news that we all hope we don't get, that it's not going to be viable, have to flee the state. But this was the predictable outcome of the policies that Ted Cruz has been pursuing. And he doesn't want to talk about this. He wants to get in front of a camera about everything uh, except this, because of what's happening in Texas is a disaster, and we know that we can only restore it at the federal level. Uh, he won't even protect IVF. After the ruling in Alabama, we had a panic uh, in Texas clinics uh, for, for families who were hoping to try and welcome a child mm -hmm. who were worried that their embryos were now at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that's untenable for us. It's, it's outrageous. Uh, and I know that when I'm in the Senate, we will restore this right. Democratic candidate for Senate in Texas, Congressman Colin Allred. Thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. We appreciate it.
Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.